now to Michael Humer. So hopefully you had no issue getting to his paper. So you can go to his, his, his website here. Um, and once you get to his website, it's easy to get to his, um, his papers. So just go to research papers, and then it, you get, once you get to the papers, you see a whole list of them. Um, and it's, it's gonna be underneath the politics and law part is the right to own a gun. And then when we get to um, immigration uh, next week is a right to immigrate. That's where you'll find the paper. I'll direct you um, next week when we get to it. Okay, so let's go to the let's go to the top of this presentation here. All right, so Michael Humer's uh, the right to own a gun. Really, we'll get um, partway through section four of this paper. There's five sections of the paper. Um, the fifth one is lengthy. The fourth and fifth are lengthy, but we'll get um, partway through the fourth section. That's at least my game plan uh, for this time. Okay, so um, there's humor, um, professor of philosophy at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, you know, a couple of, you know, maybe brief words about him. He's written extensively in, in um, ethics, epistemology, metaphysics, really just uh, most of the subdisciplines of philosophy he's made significant contributions to in his career. When it comes to ethics and politics, he tends to be on the um, libertarian, um, um, liberalism side of things, um, emphasizes personal liberties and freedoms uh, in his writings. Um, he's even at least in some of his papers, he's a bit of a proto or a bit of a, a kind of, um, um, how do I put it, a sophisticated um, anarchist of sorts, um, whereby he seems to be arguing that um, that political authority is by and large um, um, ultimately gonna end up being unjustified. Um, if I understand him correctly, as, as people become more virtuous, there's less need for government. And so he, um, he thinks that the reason that governments make sense now and can be justified now and historically is because um, people just aren't virtuous enough, but as time goes on um, and people get better, hopefully um, that um, government will become unjustified. insofar as I'm understanding his position correctly on the front. Um, I went to graduate school uh, with someone who studied under a humor as, a, as an undergrad and was a basically humor disciple. And that was um, how he reported quite a bit of uh, humor to me, at least his political and moral philosophy. Okay, so we're dealing with the issue of gun rights. And so it's important to get you know, clear on this idea of rights. Like maybe initially, when you think about rights, it might be helpful to think about, you know, the claims that um, that one can make on others if um, if one has rights, um, and usually corresponding to rights is this this um, this notion of duty or obligation. So um, when someone has a right to something they make a claim on others for that something, um, meaning that the others in some sense are required that they have an, an obligation or a duty to, um, to make sure that the right is satisfied, not violated. So if someone has, for example, um, quite plausibly in our society, the right not to be killed, um, then others have a duty, um, not to kill. Um, um, they may have other duties, duties not to interfere with those things that would um, lead to someone being killed or they're dying, et cetera. So, um, so where there's rights, there's usually corresponding duties, maybe always, maybe necessarily, there's debates about these things that we don't need to get into, but um, at the very least, there's a very close connection between the two. Um, and there's also, you know, positive and negative rights, which correspond with positive and ne negative duties, which are very 
you know, commonsensical when you're thinking about these issues. So think about how you may have the, um, the negative right not to be killed, the negative right not to be interfered with, with respect to your speech and your expressions. Um, but um, there are also instances of, of positive rights, um, um, the right to be benefited, um, the paradigmatic case might be, you know, to be benefit, you know, children to be benefited by their parents, um, or you know, maybe citizens to be benefited by the government. Um, that or the, the government um, uh, that is um, the basis of the political society in which they're living. So typically, the negative rights um, will be understood as like the right not to be interfered with, um, just very generally. And then the positive rights will be the right to be benefited, um, not just to be not interfered with. And then correspondingly, there are the um, negative and positive duties. So the negative duties would be the duty not to interfere, or we have, uh, um, um, you can understand the negative duties as just involving very, just very generally these duties of non-interference. So um, the duty, um, the duty not to kill others, the duty not to prevent um, people from getting the resources that they need to stay alive, et cetera. Um, and then positive duty is the duty to, to benefit someone. So think about the positive duty that parents have to their children, the positive duty that their governments or you know, legislators have to the citizens within the political society. Okay. So, um, so we have um, negative and positive rights corresponding with negative and positive duties. Okay, so in addition to thinking about rights um, in that way, we can think about the difference between legal and moral rights. So the first thing, thing maybe the first thing maybe to note here is that um, humor his. Um, discussion of rights begins with the claim that there are rights that um, that we have independently of belonging to a political community. And so sometimes it's put this way, we have rights even in a state of nature. So the concept of a state of nature is a prominent one in the history of political philosophy. To be in a state of nature means to be in a state um, in which there's no political sovereign, there's no government, there's no civil authority. It can be put in different ways, but there's no common political power um, to enforce rules, laws, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are many who think that, um, that there can still be moral rights had um, in such stateless conditions, if I can put it that way, or there are uh, moral rights that can be had, um, as is often put, in um, in states of nature. And so um, it might be that, you know, paradigmatically that we have the right to self-preservation. We have that right, even if we don't belong to a political society, um, even if we are, um, in effect, stateless. Um, now, it might have become increasingly rare to be stateless. So it might be most helpful to think about maybe the distant past when people lived in perhaps smaller tribes of individuals where no one had ascended to political prominence within their tribe. Uh, maybe there's family, you know, leadership of some kind, but it doesn't really get to the level of, you know, political formation, political society. It's helpful to think about that, help to think about people living together in these small units in the woods in the ancient past, if you want to think about it you know, prehistory, you know, pre-recorded history. Um, you might think that people had the right to self-preservation, the right to some form of expression. Um, okay. Um, the right to life. Um, there's debates even about that, but the right to the self-preservation is sort of one of these anchored um, moral rights that's often theorized about, even in um, states of nature. So we say that um, given that these rights aren't dependent on belonging to a political society, they're moral rights, okay? And these legal rights would be the rights that, um, that one would have in a political society. 
So the political society is such that there's some form of you know, government that takes form, whatever form, whether it's monarchy, oligarchy, democracy, okay? Um, there are, of course, other um, forms of government, but those are the three big ones that come to mind initially when you think about the different kinds of governments that could form um, as a basis of a political society. And there you end up with like, you know, presumably some legislative ability, some legislative um, authority, creating laws, passing laws, and then, then they can be enforced. So obviously, obviously one of the crucial differences between like being like between living in a state of nature and living in a political society is that in a political society there are laws and those laws can be enforced because uh, there's a common political power. So um, we can have the legal rights and some of the legal rights could be based on our moral rights, um, but they needn't be. Yeah. And there's debate about the proper foundation of the legal rights, right? Whether they're grounded in our moral rights, right? Or whether they're only partially so, or whether they're, you know, it's entirely separate. You know, entirely distinct domains, um, right? Um, a case to think about here might be might be helpful. Think about how um, um, just a short time ago in um, U.S. history, it was legal to own other people. Um, people had the right, in the legal sense, to own other people, um, but I think a pretty easy case could be made that, um, that there's no moral right to own another person. Okay, just to give maybe another easy kind of example. Okay, um, then there's also a difference between fundamental and derivative rights. So the fundamental rights um, are gonna be um, the rights that um, serve as the basis for the other rights that we have. So um, maybe, you know, among the fundamental rights is the right to, is the right to self-preserve um, and perhaps relatedly the right to life. Um, moreover, there could be sort of degrees of like fundamentality. So it could be that the right to self-preserve is like something that's absolutely fundamental. If you can't derive that right from any other for any further right. Uh, but then the right to life you might think is like it's fundamental, but it's it's not as fundamental as the um, right to self preservation. It might be some like the right to life might derive from the right to self preservation, just as a possibility in logical space. Um, and then the derivative rights are obviously going to be the rights that right that um, we derive from the fundamental rights. Um, and in some cases they're derivative, or at least in many cases are derivative because they serve in a way to kind of like uphold the, fund the fundamental or the more fundamental rights. So, um, um, so having the right, this fundamental right to self-preservation, right from that to arrive, the right to life, the, having the right to life might be the kind of thing that, um, um, help secure the right to self-preservation. That's maybe an easy example. Um, um, or maybe the free, you know, the, the right to uh, free speech is a fundamental uh, right that we would have um, either morally or in a political society. Um, so we have the, maybe fundamentally we have the right to free speech. Um, and then we might have the freedom from censorship um, when it comes to um, um, thinking about, you know, writing newspapers and the like. So think about like, you know, broadcast journalist, journalism rights. Um, there might be a derivative right, but the freedom from sense, the, or sorry, the, the right to not be censored um, as a derivative right is the kind of thing that um, allows for the protection or the upholding of the fundamental uh, the more fundamental or the fundamental right to free speech as maybe another sort of easy example to have in mind. Um, so perhaps the right to not be censored is um, 
is just the sort of the, the more general, easy, exa easier example to use. But then that could obviously bifurcate into these different right rights to not be censored in these different domains. Okay. Um, um, the reason why th this discussion is important in thinking about the right to own ownership is because we could ask, well, what, which right is the right to own guns typically classed under, right? Is it a fundamental right or is it a derivative right? And Humer early on in his papers wants to claim that it's, it's actually in a way both. So a right can be both fundamental and derivative in the sense that um, it's fundamental in the sense that other rights could derive from it. Um, and of course, we know what it means for right to be derivative. So um, this just is um, a way of understanding like what it means to say that there's sort of like these degrees of like fundamentality, but then also that, um, that all it means for right to be fundamental is that we can derive other rights from it. So you might think that they're sort of like, uh, if, if we were to just be more fine grained in our discussion here, it might be helpful to think about they're like being absolutely fundamental rights from which no, right? Uh, that, that derived from no further more fundamental right. Those are the absolutely fundamental ones. And then they're relatively fundamental rights. Okay, rights that, um, that derive from um, uh, more fundamental rights, but then also from which we derive further derived rights. I know that's, that's a bit heady and abstract, but that's the idea. Um, then there's um, absolute and prima facie rights. So an absolute right is gonna be a right that, um, that can't be overridden and, um, and perhaps can't be you know, forfeited. Okay, so um, there's the, their debate about whether there are any absolute rights, rights that can't be overridden um, or forfeited. Um, let's just think about the overridden bit. Um, so um, if there's um, a right that can't be overridden, Maybe again, once again, it's sort of something rock bottom, like the right to self-preservation, or perhaps the right, um, perhaps the right not to be enslaved. That seems like a pretty um, a pretty good candidate for putting among the absolutes absolute rights we may have, insofar as we have one or have any. Um, I'm not so sure the humor thinks we have any. I think, I think he's open to there being none, but we can still like understand the concept and debate whether there are any. Um, the right not to be tortured might be included here. The right not to be raped. Um, and there's questions about whether, so those are negative uh, rights. I want good question, are there any positive, um, positive rights maybe children have an absolute positive right to be benefited by their parents. That's a good question. That's a really good question about that, that, that last example. So I just throw that throw it out there to ponder. And the prima facie rights, as you can guess, these are going to be the opposite of absolute rights. These are the overridable. Okay. And perhaps the forfeitable. So prima facie, this is a, a term we get from Latin. That means like, um, it might just, we might just define it to mean like non-absolute. That's sort of an easy way of defining. Once you understand what an absolute uh, right is and you define prima facie um, rights in terms of it, that could be helpful. Um, um, sometimes, so the, the term prima facie just means something like at first glance or initially, uh, generally, okay? So a prima facie right, it would be one that generally holds, even though there are exceptions to it holding or, exce or exceptions um, to it being the, um, 
to it being the what we might call the all things considered right hat in a certain in a circumstance. So, like you may have the prima facie right to uh, uh, freedom of speech. So generally, right, they're not absolutely hold. So think about like you know the classic examples of yelling fire in a crowded theater that you learn in high school and thereafter. Um, so we might say we have a prima facie right to freedom of speech, but then when our speech um, endangers others, then the, um, the competing rights or the competing rights um, um, that people have to security, right? In a political society um, outweighs or overrides the prima facie right to free speech. And so we might then say that um, um, in some cases, even though the freedom of speech is a significant prima facie right, it is not all things considered. Um, it ended up being a right that we have or the right that ends up prevailing in a circumstance because people's security or the security of the citizenry in certain circumstances would outweigh or override the prima facie right to freedom of speech just to give some examples or give an example. Easy to multiply examples once you get the form, get the idea. But I'm guessing that these examples, they're, they're fairly intuitive. So these distinctions are ones that it, even if you hadn't drawn them before today's um, uh, lecture, um, I'm explicitly, likely they were implicit in your thinking. So once we talk about the absolute and prima facie rights, then the abs then the overridden versus forfeited rights discussion or distinction makes sense. So there's one thing to have a right overridden, it's another thing to have a right forfeited. So, um, so the example of having a right overridden, you know, was captured just a moment ago. So suppose you have the prima facie right to freedom of speech. That right to freedom of speech can be overridden by um, the right of security had by the citizenry in a political society. Okay, that captures the idea of yelling fire in a crowded theater or, um, or issuing um, other kinds of you know, dangerous um, hate speech. So there, like the right, the prima facie right to freedom of speech, it's still there. I mean, it's still had, it's just that it's overridden by this other right that's more fundamental or in the circumstances otherwise more important, okay? Um, that's different from having a right forfeited where it's as if the right, it, it vanishes. Having the right, the prima facie right even just, just disappears. So of course it would have to be a prime face right if it's forfeited because it's absolute, it would seem like, like that right is never overridden or forfeited. So if you imagine a case where um, someone has the right to life, or maybe we'll just say, um, um, let's just say people generally have the prime facial right to life. Um, let that be our, our prime facial right. Now imagine right, there you are, um, given that you're a part of everyone, you have the prima facie right to life. But now imagine um, a scenario in which you're a victim of attack. So some perpetrator is threatening your life and is overtake, trying to overtake you um, enough to, to end your life as far as you could tell. Let's just suppose that that's what they're doing. So their intention is, um, by God forbid, of course. Um, so um, one might argue in these circumstances that the um, that even though um, um, the the um, the perpetrator, you know, prior to engaging with um, with you, prior to um, attacking you, had the prima facie right to life, that once the um, perpetrator um, inflicts kind of violence that he or she is on you, that they then don't have their right to life overridden. 
they rather have their right to life like, forfeited so they can actually like in the, that circumstance lose their right to life um, even if only temporarily but they can lose their right to life um, and um, some claim that in such in such circumstances the forfeiture of their right to life um, can all things being equal um, make it permissible for that person to be killed so um, maybe the idea here would be that um, when you're being attacked by someone right, you're not the perpetrator the other person's a perpetrator you're a victim um, you can do what's necessary to 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 save your life, to preserve your life, keep yourself alive in accordance with having the right to life, having the right to self-preserve. And so if what's necessary, like what's truly necessary involves killing the assailant, then, um, um, then that would be permissible. And some argue that what sort of grounds the permissibility there is that the perpetrator has forfeited his right to life once he's become an attacker. Once he's created a state of war, sometimes it's called. Okay, so lots of distinctions, but um, I think important ones moving forward. And then according to humor, he has this assumption, many people have this assumption in the literature, um, having a right to something is the initial presumption. This is the liberty presumption. Um, Perhaps this is um, a foundational idea in um, you know, just liberalist thinking, you know, generally. Um, we think about you know, liberal political societies, we think um, that part of what makes them liberal societies, not in the sense that they're you know, largely voting Democrat or some such, that's not what's meant. It's just that when we think about the, the function of a political, the function of, of a political society or a government, one of its dominant functions, if not the dominant function is the liberty of it, the citizenry. Um, the core idea seems to be like, look, um, when it comes to um, like whether or not people can engage in certain activities, um, the initial presumption is that they can, unless there are like, countervailing reasons to the contrary. And so that's why um, we might say here, for example, in the developed world or here in the US, just to use the easiest example um, and where my history is the strongest, um, we could think about how, um, you know, like, you know, females being able to vote, right? Um, but that's an activity. And the presumption should be that females have the right to vote unless, they're good, unless there's good reasons, countervailing reasons to the contrary. We know there aren't any, so we move forward, right? as a society and female suffrage is permissible, right? Then you think about the civil rights movements, right? And you think about activities, right? Of, you know, of, of the African-Americans and, and other marginalized groups and how, and how they wanted to participate in voting and other everyday activities, right? unless there were countervailing reasons to the contrary, they should be able to engage in these activities, right? We saw that there weren't good reasons historically Right, um, and of course, there's still there's still you know quite a bit of work that needs to be done on 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 those fronts, right? And the contemporary the, the contemporary political climate here in the U.S. Uh, suggests that, anyways. Um, of course, there's some debate to be had about that, but um, um, right, think about the issue of of gay marriage, right? Um, that's another issue. They um, you know gay couples want to get married. That's an activity that they want to get involved with, unless there are good reasons, right? The countervailing reasons to the contrary, they should be able to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So um, uh, humor is in this tradition that, you know, has this liberty presumption. And it's one that, at least for many um, in, you know, the, you know liberal um, countries, liberal political societies, right, they assume it as well. Okay. All right, so let's talk about this, this issue of weighing rights. Um, and this, this issue is important in part because um, thinking about gun rights, there's gonna be the right to own a gun and that's gonna be compared you know, with 
um, the right that people have not to be victims of gun violence, okay? So let's think about the issue of weighing rights. Um, so the weight of a fundamental right is determined by significance to one's life plans or one's life plans. Um, so, um, um, so that's the way I captured Humor's like, initial claim, but he ends up ends up qualifying it a little bit and makes it um, makes it makes maybe makes the point a bit um, weaker. And he puts it this way um, in his paper: If an action violates rights, then the violation is more the, uh, is more serious, the more it interferes with the victim's life plans. Um, okay, so and here I. I use the you know the expression like life plans in part to capture um, you know something about how um, about how it's not just maybe every individual desire that's going to matter um, significantly right so not every um, action that violates you know rights um, not 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 every violation of a right is going to be that significant if it if, if all that results from it is that some perhaps minor desire isn't satisfied. This idea of life plans is supposed to be that we're talking about like, you know, the things that people are really um, striving toward, the goals that they have, as opposed to just having their desire satisfied. So, um, so big picture, I take um, what's important here, the takeaway to be that at any given time, we're gonna have a wide range of desires. Anybody any given time, you can have a wide range of desires, but only really a small subset of those desires are really part of, you know, one's goals. One are, are part of our, our, our desires that, um, that one really takes a conscious or you know, even partially conscious effort at trying to right, have satisfied. Okay, so that's what is meant by life plans here, life goals. Okay, not just every, any desire, um, even whimsical desires had by people. Um, so I just, in parentheses here, just say, let's consider the right, the right to life here. So if an action, you know, violates someone's, um, someone's um, rights, right, um, then just going back to the conditional claim here, then the violation is more serious, the more it interferes with the victim's life plans. Well, so suppose an action violates someone's right to life. Well, obviously, one, right, one's right to life is significant to their life plans. They, they have to be alive in order to, right, to, in order for their life plans to be executed or to be attained, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the right to life example, right, sort of an easy one to sort of fill in here to capture the significance of. Um, of humor's claim. So the more serious the, the, the violation is with respect to interfering with the victim's life plans, um, right, the more serious um, the, the rights violation. Um, um, you might, um, you might have compared this um, in your, you know, your own thinking about this. I don't want to stop here. I, I don't want to get. I don't want to get political. Um, so I'm just going to try to put this neutrally and, and leave it for food for thought. Compare this right with the right not to wear a mask, uh, and I'll stop and move on. But that's you know, something that may be helpful um, thinking about, uh, um, you know, humor's. You know, principle here about weighing rights. Um, just continuing on with understanding the weighing of rights, the significance of a derivative rights violation. So we focus now here on just derivative rights violations. There are going to be two important points to note: is determined by how important the more fundamental right right is observed, it subserves is. Right. So um, if the derivative right. Um, it's subserving the right to life, 
um, in one scenario, and then we have another derivative right, and what it's subserving is the right to one's you know property. Then the um, the derivative right that's protecting or securing or otherwise helping us preserve right the right to life or the um, not violate the right to life is going to be more important than the other derivative right. So you might think about this like. Um, you know, diagrammatically, if you have like a derivative right one and derivative right one is significant for securing the right to life, right? And that's our more fundamental right. And then diagrammatically on the other side, we have, you know, derivative right two, right? We're comparing derivative right one with derivative right two, right? When we weigh rights. The derivative right two is securing just the right to one's property. When we weigh the right to one's property versus the right to life, the right to life outweighs the right to one's property. So derivative right one, right, weighs more, all things being equal, or is weightier than um, the derivative right two, put abstractly. So that's a way of capturing this first point. And then the second point, the significance of a derivative rights violation is also determined by how significant the derivative right is to the, to the more fundamental right it, uh, it subserves. So a way of capturing this is to consider derivative right one, once again, derivative right two. So we have these two derivative rights, right? And they're both um, in some way related to some common more fundamental right. And so um, if we use um, you know, humor's example, let's consider the fundamental right in this example being the right to free speech. Um, now suppose our derivative rights that are um, that are you know helpful in um, in protecting the right to free speech, derivative right right one, we could imagine is Right, the right to criticize right, the government or something like that, the right to criticize political power and authority in a political society. Um, and that's one way in which freedom of speech is protected. And then the other derivative right would be, you know, the right to, you know, publish pornographic material, right? Pornographic content, right? So both of these, right? Could be both of these derivative rights are, you know, are and can be significant to protecting the right to free speech, you know, just just very generally. But it would seem that the um, the first derivative right, the right to criticize, right, the powers that be in a political society, the government, a political society, is more important to protecting free speech than is the right. Um, the, the other derivative right that's competing with the first derivative right, the right to, um, to publish pornographic material. Okay. So that was humorous example that seems to, to uh, this seems you know, quite intuitive. We have these two derivative rights, which one is weightier? Well, in the second case we're thinking about, well, um, the, weighty, the, the, the more weighty right is gonna be one that's more important to secure and protecting the more fundamental right. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead, uh, Alicia. So are you saying that the right to life is a fundamental right and the right to wear a mask would be derivative? Well, um, I wasn't, um, so, so you're kind of going back a slide here, aren't you? Yeah, I'm just trying. So the idea would be that, um, um, like, just suppose, suppose that, um, so I didn't want, I, I was kind of moving on, but I'll come back to this. Um, so my point is clear. So good question. Um, when you think, when you think about the right, to, the right to life, I mean, it might be the case that both are derivative in some sense. It just might be the case that the right to life is more fundamental. Does that make sense? Given that there's degrees of fundamentality. Right, Pres presumably, the right to to not wear a mask, right, is is not as fundamental as the right to life, right? That, so that, it's that's because, the right. 
because the consequence is more secure is more severe like death versus like a piece of the fabric yeah if an action violates my right to life like it's going to be very very severe right that violation is severe it's stringent i mean because it interferes significantly with my life plans it stops my life plans that makes sense i'm not able to complete my life plans as it were um but now consider um let's just suppose that it violates someone's rights to um um that they that they that they're, that they're wearing a mask because they have a right not to wear a mask but now you know the um the powers that be the government officials the governors or whoever come out and say um, in these certain circumstances, in these situations, you have to wear a mask. So let's just suppose that it's a rights violation that people have to wear masks in such circumstances. It doesn't seem like it's that serious, right? Because wearing a mask isn't the kind of thing or the, 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 the rights violation of having to wear a mask isn't the kind of thing that interferes with anyone's life plans, at least not, at least not significantly. Does that make sense? So that, that, that sort of can be our guide to how weighty the right to not wear a mask is compared to other rights, like the right to life and others that we could identify. You know what I mean? The, you could compare that with the right not to be subjected to, um, to um, the possibility of, 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 con of contacting um, a, a coronavirus from others. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm thinking about it like the right to your health versus the right to bodily autonomy um yeah i mean bodily autonomy is important but but the the issue is is it right not to wear a mask like um i mean the right to bodily autonomy is like something that's very very coarse grain Does that makes sense so even even um even when we consider the right to bodily autonomy, there's still going to be underneath it sort of a range of, of other rights that are derived from it. And then from there, we can ask, well, how weighty are those rights? Does that make sense? So if we keep okay. the conversation at the right to bodily autonomy, at that level of discussion, we're sort of missing out on what's really important. And it's the precisification of that right or the, 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 the relevant right that's derived from it. That's significant. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. So I do think that like some of these public discussions about these issues are um, are suffering from just a lack of fine grainness, right? A lack of just careful attention to the detail um, that matters. Because they're over generalizing a right rather than looking at the specific of they're, they're thinking about the, the more fundamental right from which the more specific one is derived. So okay. That makes sense. And then that needs to be, that needs to be. Um, so the question is, is, is the right not to wear a mask, the kind of thing like that's really, really important to one's bodily autonomy. And it doesn't seem that it is, right? Right. Um, so that's... Um, uh, but are, then are we... Go ahead. And would we be presupposing that co that contracting COVID nineteen guarantees death? No. Why would we do that? If we're saying that the right to life is equivalent to, I was well. No one. Not, I, didn't, I wasn't doing that. I was just saying. Okay. I was just saying. Compare the right to life, right? When you think yeah. about you know, humor's um, claim here about weighing, uh, weighing rights with the right to not wear a mask. Not that, um, not that by saying that, I'm saying that contracting um, COVID-19 is on a par with having one's right to life um, compromised. Okay. I would just say you could think about Right, this if then claim using the right to life. And then independently, you can think about the right not to wear a mask, right? Independent of the, the right to life. So they're independent claims, right? You just independently can think about how 
right? Weighty or right is by thinking about this, right? How significant is it in interfering with one's life plans, right? That one's right to life be violated, full stop. And then you can consider, well, how significant it is to one's life plans that their right not to wear a mask is being violated, you see? And that's the relevant issue. So they were independent of each other. They were just different possible examples that you could use. Okay, and, so what you're saying. Yep. And so, yeah, I use a mass example just as an educative point, right? Because I do think that there are debates going on about the mask issue. And I was hoping that, um, that um, if we're thinking about humor's claim here, and if we think that, gosh, it's intuitive, then run the, run the right not to wear a mask example and see what the result is. Perhaps that'll help us think um, about um, that issue a bit more clearly. Um, as well as you know these other you know claims about derivative rights, I think they can as well. So the right not to wear a mask is not like it's not significant to um, to upholding right um, bodily autonomy, the right to bodily autonomy, compared to like um, the right not to be hooked up to. Um, um, uh, or the right not to be um, you know, forced to um, um, have surgeries or to be connected to um, um, you know, uh, strangers who might need your, um, your, your kidneys for blood uh, de uh, detoxifying or something like that, right? Um, presumably you have a right not to be interfered with in that way. And 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 it's and those rights are significant. Those river rights are significant to your bodily autonomy in a way that the right not to wear a mask is. Right? In a way that the right not to wear a mask isn't. Right? I think I said that right. Um, I mean, in case I didn't, um, we think that the right to be not interfered with in the in the ways described, where someone would force you to be hooked up to someone who needs um, your kidneys for blood detoxification, right? I think that, that, right, that rights like those are very important to the, protecting the right to bodily autonomy, right? Compare that with the right not to wear a mask with it, that, it, the significance of that right to the right to bodily autonomy, right? And intuitively, um, the right not to wear a mask is, is not contributing nearly in a significant way to bodily autonomy as. Um, the, um, the right not to be interfered with such that you're being forced medically to be plugged into someone who needs your kidney for a blood detoxifying or detoxification. Okay. Good. All right. So, um, so then the question becomes um, for humor, do we have a prima facie moral right to own a gun? And what humor wants to say initially is, well, given the presumption of liberty, the answer would seem to be yes, yes, we do. Right? Unless they're sort of countervailing um, arguments to the contrary. And so what humor does is considers some of these countervailing reasons to deny the right to gun ownership. So many of these Reasons have been offered. We'll look at three following uh, humor. So here's argument one. So I just kind of put it in simple premise conclusion form. Um, so we don't have the prima facie right to harm others, to treat others as mere means, to think about you know, the Kantian formula of humanity here, to use others without consent without their consent, okay? Um, this seems pretty good. This seems pretty golden. So among the prima facie rights we have, the prime, we don't have the prima facie right to go out and just harm others, to treat people as mere means to our ends. Um, paradigmatic, you know, kind of case here to, Treat people as if they're like, you know, our property. Think about the case of slavery. And then to use others without our consent. 
Does that be related to the slavery case? Perhaps a torture case. Okay. Torturing someone seems to involve um, a lack of consent, right, necessarily. Just to give some examples here, to give this some content too. Um, we also don't have the prime facial right to do or have things that make it more likely to harm others, to treat people as mere means, or to use others without consent. So I'm doing here, and I think that humor maybe um, teases out two separate arguments here, and I kind of put them together into one. So you can imagine um, moving from one to three to four. So I'm going to build in two. Hope that's okay. Um, we also don't have the prime facial right to do or have things that make it more likely to harm others, treat people as mere means, or to use others without consent. And owning a gun makes it more likely to harm others, to treat people as mere means, or to use others without consent. And so then we don't have the prime facial right to own guns. I think there's another way this argument could have gone, could have one could have been presented by the humor, but I'm just gonna follow him. So we don't have a private right to own the guns. Okay. Of course, the thought here would be that owning a gun would make it more likely to harm others. Uh, guns are violent weapons, or weapons that can be used for violence against others. Um, we could treat people as mere instruments, mere tools, mere means with guns. Um, just think about the kind of um, um, the kind of threats that can be invoked using firearms against people. And then obviously um, those threats could create quite a bit of psychological distress, which rules out the capacity to consent. Okay. All right, so that's the basic idea of three and then four, so we don't have a prime face right to own guns. So humor's reply to this one, let's go to his paper. This paper up already. Um, maybe I don't. I want to look at a uh, passage. Okay. So section three is um, where he responds to the arguments he developed earlier that I'm kind of putting together in my discussion. So given the presumption uh, in, liberty, in favor of liberty, there's at least a prima facie right to own a gun. We already talked about that. And unless there are positive grounds of the sort discussed in section 2.1 for denying such a right, are there such grounds? So begin with the principle that one lacks a right to do things that harm others, treat others as um, mere means, or to use others without their consent. It's difficult to see how owning a gun could itself be said to do any of those things, even though owning a gun makes it easier for one to do those things, even if one chooses. Um, but we, but we do not normally prohibit activities um, that merely make it easier for one to perform a wrong, but require a separate decision to perform the wrongful act. Okay, so that's basically his response to his first argument. So, um, so basically, his challenge to the first argument is to challenge the second premise. And so his claim without giving examples is just to say normally um, we don't deny people the prime facial right to things, even though those things make it more likely that we would, or that we could harm others, treat people as mere means, use others without consent, et cetera. We would need some kind of like independent kind of argument for that, um, um, the activity in question and its permissibility. Okay. So, I mean, you might like to fill in the gaps here a little bit, maybe um, you know, owning a car is the kind of thing right, that could uh, make it uh, more likely that you harm others, right? Because now you have this like moving vehicle that can run people over, right? Et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so that's to just give some content to humor's challenge to the second premise here. Or argument one. Okay, hopefully that's clear. 
in the reply. Argument two, we don't have a prima facie right to do things that, that impose excessive though unintentional risks on others. Okay. Owning guns imposes excessive though un unintentional risks on others. So we do not have a prima facie right to own guns. Okay. So um, it looks like one's okay, at least initially, isn't it? I mean, this excessive would have to get like further defined. So the debate may come down to two, whether, whether or not um, owning guns imposes excessive though unintentional risks on others. So the thought would be that um, even if it's conceded that gun owners, right, by and large, the vast majority of them don't intend to harm others, to put others at risk, et cetera. Right? And the fact that um, um, according to the second premise, it would be like, even though that, even though they don't intend to, they still you know, impose excessive risks on others. So in response, um, uh, humor claims, um, consider the principle that one lacks a right to do things that impose unacceptable though unintended risks on others. Since life is replete with risks to be plausible, the principle must use some notion we must use some notion of excessive risks. I've already anticipated this idea. This idea of excessive risk would have to get defined. Um, there's a sense in which like we assume reasonable risks like all the time. So this idea of excessive risk would have to get fleshed out. Um, the car example is a perfectly good one. We assume reasonable risks just by getting in a car. We assume reasonable risks just by driving on public roads, et cetera. But the risks associated with normal ownership and recreational use of fire, firearms are minimal. So he's gonna challenge the excessive risk claim that's in that second premise of the second argument. While approximately 77 million Americans now own guns, this paper was written in the early 2000s. The accidental death rate for firearms has fallen dramatically during the last century and is now about 0.3 per 1,000 population. For comparison, the average citizen is 19 times more likely to die as a result of an accidental fall. 50 times more likely to die in an automobile accident than to die as a result of a firearms accident. Okay. We don't stop people from you know, walking on um, sidewalks. We don't stop people from, from walking generally or running generally. And we don't stop people from um, driving automobiles. Um, I mean, we do in some cases, of course, but they're gonna be the rare cases. Um, okay. And then, um, he considers a potential counter. Some may think that firearms, firearms accident statistics miss the point. The real risk that gun ownership imposes on others is the risk that, gun, that the gun owner or someone else will lose control during an argument and decide to shoot his opponent. Nicholas Dixon argues in 1990 that 34.5% of all murders resulted from domestic or other kinds of argument. Since we are all capable of heated arguments, we are all in in the wrong circumstances, capable of losing control and killing our opponent. In response, we should note first, or we should first note the invalidity of Dixon's argument. And he gives an example to capture the fact that the argument that was run by Dixon fails. Suppose that 34.5% uh, of people who run a four minute mile have black hair and that I have black hair, it does not follow that I'm capable of running a four minute mile. Um, it seems like that only very atypical individuals would respond to heated arguments by killing their opponents, okay? So you have this set of murders that occur, and then within the set of murders, um, um, you do investigation and find that 34.5% um, that of the murders um, resulted from um, domestic heated arguments and the like. Okay, and um, so from that, you can't make the kind of generalizations that uh, Dixon makes and humor takes him to task for that with his example. Um, so let's just think about his example. Take all, take the um, set of individuals who are capable of running a four minute mile and 34.5% of them, you know, was, you can use the same statistic, right? Um, have black hair, who wouldn't follow from that, that, right, that is, that, um, that humor himself is capable of running uh, a, four, a four minute mile, given the circumstances are right. It wouldn't follow that he's 34.5% likely to run a four minute mile either, right? Because the set of, of those who can run a four minute uh, mile itself is going to be a very, very, very small set. 
uh, of, of human beings. So that's a way of capturing sort of the fallacious um, inference that Dixon makes. Dixon, second Dixon and McMahon's, doesn't mention McMahon, he must be in the footnote. Claims are refuted by the, by the empirical evidence in the largest 75 counties in the United States in 1988, over 89% of adult murderers had prior criminal records as adults. This reinforces a common sense view that normal people are extremely unlikely to commit murder even if they have the means available. So gun, so gun ownership does not typically impose excessive risks on others. Okay. So those who tend to commit murder with firearms, they tend to be those who, right, um, have criminal records prior, so then they're a small percentage of the population already. Okay, um, and then lastly, consider the idea that individuals lack a right to engage in activities that reasonably appear to evince an intention to harm or impose an unacceptable risk on others. This principle does not apply here as it's acknowledged on all sides that only a tiny fraction of America's 77 million gun owners plan to commit crimes with guns. Um, so that's just to consider the case of, of those who actually have the positive intention to um, impose um, um, risks on others with their firearms. And then the counter is just like, look, um, it's read on both sides that the vast majority of the you know, millions and millions of people that own guns there, uh, not and um, intentionally um, putting people at risk through their ownership of the firearm. Okay, the third argument, the social cost of private gun ownership outweighs its benefits. Um, so this is a kind of utilitarian argument. If the, social, if the total social cost of private gun ownership outweighs its benefits, then we don't have a prime facial right to own guns. And then three, so we don't have a prima facie um, right um, to gun ownership. Okay, so it's just a simple cost benefit analysis here. So there may be all kinds of benefits that come from um, the private ownership of guns, recreational um, goods, but also self-defense goods. Um, and then, but the costs, think about all the homicides with firearms, and then you just continue to add to the list and then end up with the conclusion that the cost benefit analysis favors denying private gun ownership. That's how the argument goes. In response to this, humor claims, it might be argued that the total social costs, so I'm trying to use the same language so that we were consistent, um, a private gun ownership is significant that the state is unable to identify in advance those persons who are going to misuse their weapons and that the state's only viable method of significantly reducing that social cost is thus to prevent even non-criminal citizens from owning guns. But this is not an argument against the existence of a prima facie right to own a gun. It's just an argument for, for overriding any such right. So there still may be the prima facie right, just the prima facie right could be overridden in the best case scenario when we do the cost benefit analysis. That's what he's claiming here. In general, the fact that restricting an activity has beneficial consequences does not show that no weight at all should be assigned to the freedom to engage in it. So there might be quite a bit of weight assigned to um, the freedom or the rights associated with having um, or owning uh, firearms. It simply shows that there are competing reasons that allow, that, that the reasons against allowing the activity. Right? Compare, um, suppose that taking my car from me and giving it to you increases uh, total social welfare. It, was, it would not follow that I have no claim at all right, on my car. Of course, of course, um, of course I would. I mean, if you run it in the first person for you, of course it would for you as well. Right. And, he goes, and he goes on to note, it's difficult to deny the existence of, a, of at least a prima facie right to own a gun, but this says nothing about the strength of this right. right. So there has to be some work done in establishing how significant the right to um, own a gun is nor about the grounds there may be for overriding it. Most gun control advocates would claim not that there is not even a prima facie right to own a gun, but that the right is just a minor one, and that the harms of private gun ownership in comparison are very large. So even if the cost benefit analysis doesn't favor private gun ownership, that doesn't mean that we don't have a prima facie right to own a gun. Um, and then moreover, what humor's gonna end up arguing um, later in the paper is that even if we assume, again, that um, the total social cost of private gun ownership 
um, um, favors um, denying people the right to own guns um, or sorry, even if the total social, social costs of private ownership um, um, tends to be such that um, there's more um, harm that comes from guns, more cost that comes from private ownership than the, um, than the positives that come, the benefits that come from private ownership. Uh, it's not gonna follow that, uh, um, that we don't have a significant private facial right to um, owning guns. So the point's a bit more nuanced than I said initially. Um, so the next question then just becomes, um, is the right to own a gun significant? So going back to argument three, just very quickly to deal with um, just the upshot of, of Humer's reply um, is a challenge too. So we could still have a prime facial right to own guns, um, even if the total social cost of private gun ownership outweighs its benefits. Just might be that the prime facial right to own guns is right, is overridden. Okay, by the utilitarian calculus or calculation that's performed. Imagine how complicated that calculation would be. I'm just saying, you know, so I'll set that off to the side, but it's just worth mentioning. So the upshot here, as I said, we get into section four. The upshot of, um, of section four is going to be that the right to own a gun is significant, both recreationally and because of self defense. And so he's going to run an argument, um, arguments that, um, that establish that the recreational value of guns is, is solid, but so is the right to self defense. And they both together contribute to. Um, the uh, very strong uh, prime facia uh, right to own guns. And so what we'll do is we'll talk about those arguments uh, next time and then, um, and then discuss section five in Hume's paper. Any last questions, comments, concerns about anything that I can field before we conclude? Okay, if not, then I'll go ahead and stop. Wish you a great night. Um, stay warm and stay safe. And um, um, I'll see you all on Thursday. Take care. Good night.